it's nice to have something positive to talk about and that refocus me for an instant on on your music which i'll just get my geekdom out there right off the top we love your music uh and thank god you're writing choral music and music that uh that moves people that touches people and i know that comes from a place in you that really wants to communicate and not all composers seem like that's their goal and it, it so clearly is with you so thank you for that thank you for saying that truly thank you it means a lot to me um uh, so I, I listened to some other interviews uh, with you just to learn a little more about you. And I was really taken with your, I, mean, your, you, I hope you're not tired of talking about how you got started and, and turning to music. But a number of students here from uh, Southern Oregon University Chamber Choir, then the other people are, are from Southern Oregon Repertory Singers. Uh, um, a number of, of the college kids I know would appreciate hearing that you were late coming to music uh, and just that whole story, I think they would find really, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to. So, and, and Paul, before I start, can I ask, so who's with us? Are, are these uh, all singers in the choir? Yeah, these are all members of either the, uh, the chamber choir from the university or mm -hmm. Southern Oregon Repertory Singers, uh, who's uh, sponsoring the event. And I, I work with both those groups. Beautiful. Well, it, I'm, I'm honored to be with all of you. Um, yeah, as Paul said, I, I came late to it. I, um, I grew up in northern Nevada, so not all that far from Oregon. By the way, my sister went to school in Ashland. I mean, she, really? Yeah, she lives in Corvallis now. So I've spent a lot of time in that very area. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so beautiful there. And I, I, I don't know how many plays that I saw at the, at the Shakespeare Festival. Um, over the years. Um, so, so I really have a, a picture in my mind. I just can't imagine with the fires, how terrible that must be. Um, but I grew up in Northern Nevada and I, uh, I was the only musician in my family. I was the black sheep and I wasn't even a musician. It was just, I was the only one who spoke music. You all know what I'm talking about, right? You, you kind of just got in your blood and you, and it's baffling to you. Like I remember my father, I remember being very young, my father singing happy birthday and when you're supposed to go up, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, he would go down. And I just, it's like someone who can't see color or something, right? It just made no sense to me. But I didn't read music. Um, my parents saw at an early age that I could pick out, we, we had a piano that had been gifted from my grandmother that sat in the house and I could pick out tunes on it. And they tried to give me lessons, but I just was not interested. And I went through three or four piano teachers and I could always play by ear, but the, the idea of reading music, I, I it just never, I just, it's, I just never took to it. And um, I, I basically, I spent my entire high school career with synthesizers and drum machines writing pop music. I, I thought that, that this is what I was going to do with my life. I thought I would be a pop star. <laughs> um, and um, then I went to school when I was 18 years old and I went to Las Vegas, which was the big state school in Nevada. UNLV and I auditioned for a music scholarship. And again, I still didn't read music. So I, I remember going in and there was a, 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 the jury was there and they said, why don't you play something from your repertoire? And I didn't know what that word meant, what repertoire meant. <laughs> so I said, I just play and I improvise something on the piano. God knows what I, what I played. This is 1988. And in the room was David Weiler who is still the choir director there at UNLV. At the time, he, I think, was in his second or third year teaching. And he did whatever choir director does. You know, he's just looking for, for warm bodies, basically, and said, why don't you come across the hall here and sing for me? And I wasn't a good singer at all. I'm still not really a good singer, although the older I get, my voice is getting lower and lower, so I'm useful, but I'm, I'm just not a great singer. Um, and I remember he handed me this, this book of like a, a chorale, which it must've been a Bach chorale. And he asked me to sing the bottom line and then um, he would play the top notes, but I couldn't get past a measure. I just, it was hieroglyphics to me, but then he played it for me. He said, can you sing this? And I could, and he said, can you sing this? And I, I think he could see that I had an ear. So he, he allowed me to be in the big um, 
you know, there's two choirs, right? There's the, there's the snob chamber choir. Oh, yeah. You know, oh. Right? You know, <laughs> you know the, I, I got to be in that eventually, but, but the, <laughs> and there's the, if you have a pulse, right, <laughs> then, then you could be in this choir. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I joined the, the, if you have a pulse choir. And the first piece I sang was the Requiem by Mozart. And I remember we, we were singing through the Kyrie, which starts with the basis, right? We start that few Kyrie, then alto. And I couldn't read, but I was just sitting in the middle of the room, just trembling and with tears in my eyes and, and even doing what I do now when I hear music that moves me, giggling. Um, and looking back on it, I, I think it was the first time that I felt part of something larger than myself. Mm. It was truly transformed. I mean, I know I'm, I'm literally speaking to the choir right now. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. Um, but it, that was, that was the, the moment for me. And then I joined every single choir I could and became president of the choir social club. And I just became the world's biggest choir geek. And three years into my seven year undergraduate degree, I decided that I would write a piece for David for this man who had changed my life. And so I wrote a little piece for him called Go Lovely Rose. And by that time I was reading music pretty well, but I had a friend help me with all the harmonic spellings. And we sang through it in, in class. And that's the day that I knew I was going to be a composer. I didn't know how you do this or how that happens, but I knew this is my vocation. I, I can't do anything else. That's so beautiful. I mean, so many elements of that coming late, not knowing anything and just jumping in. I mean, that's what we're all supposed to do. That's how children learn. And somehow we get this. If I'm not, if I didn't have the background of James Levine, there's no hope for me, you know? And that's just, that's not true. Look, no. look at what you've done. Yeah, I actually now, for a while, I was, I was very self-conscious about it. I ended up doing my master's degree at, at Juilliard. And I remember at Juilliard the first year just being paralyzed, thinking I have no business being here. You know, I was trying to do all this catch-up work in music theory and reading music and surrounded by people who, as you say, just, you know, had been studying music since they could walk. No. But, but I, I came to realize that actually I was making all sorts of mistakes because of my naivete, I was, there was an approach to the way I was doing things that was just green, just completely green because I just didn't know better. And I, I fortunately didn't have much of the baggage of a traditional, um, traditional discipline, I suppose. And I, I look back now and I think actually it was, it was good. It, I think it led me down some paths that I might not have taken otherwise. Well, you know, the, the sciences teach us that, the, if you're gonna win a Nobel prize in the sciences, you're probably going to be like age 24 uh, because after that you you get set in your ways and and to see outside the parameters that's what young people can do better than us as we get older so true it's so true that you have this window of time when you when you see the world for the first time yeah i'll, I'll be honest and not to get immediately metaphysical but that's my it's my daily practice is i try still to see the world completely new everything for the first time and to to I'm, I'm always on guard against cynicism and and becoming sick with experience yeah well we've got enough of that you know Indeed. i mean in the arts we we've, we've got to lead towards beauty and beauty leads to god whatever that is for you uh, you know that that it's huh. And in the sciences, they even talk about it. You know, they say we, this equation is very complex, but we know it's true because it, of the beauty of the mathematics. So they're even looking at beauty and, and it. it's a great outlook. I agree. By the, by the way, Paul, not to interrupt, but if, or if any of you can hear a bass playing in the background, this kind of low bass, I don't know if it's picking up on my microphone. It's my teenage son. He's He's in Zoom orchestra class right now, so sorry. At least he didn't play piccolo. That's all I can say. Oh yeah, what? Um, <laughs> well, so uh, this is maybe a moment to say, I think it Eric really wants to interact with the singers. Uh, I know he's done a lot of things, Grammy award winning conductor and speaker and working with NASA and, but I think the education part uh, is is big for him. So as you have questions, 
don't wait to the end, put them in the chat bar and Richard will sort of sift through them. And I think it, it would be probably better for everyone if there were questions coming in that, that weren't just coming from me. I heard you say, Eric, about, about that Go Lovely Rose, uh, that it was, the, it was like hearing my real name for the first time. That's exactly right. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, it's so true. It's um, yeah. I, I sometimes I think as musicians, maybe you feel this way, Paul, that we were very lucky. Oh that, yeah. In that our path didn't have a lot of options. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Like, I do. Yeah, that, that somehow you're just picked up out of the paint, and this is what you have to do, not what you what you will do, but. I, it's like oxygen, right? You can't yeah. do it. And I remember feeling that way about that piece that, that it was just, oh, it became very clear to me. I, I don't know how to do this, how to do this, but this is what I'm supposed to do. It's, it's nice. Uh, you know, it's funny. You had that moment of revelation. I teach music history here. And the piece today was the Josquin de Pre Ave Maria, where I, as a 18 year old, not a music major, went to the choir concert, wasn't even in choir yet. And they sang that piece and, and I knew I had to study music. And, huh. and I, I jumped in, declared a music major the next day and, and never looked back. And I'm not inherently brave and I'm kind of a warrior and a planner and it makes no sense to go into classical choral music as a profession. Uh, I mean, you've done really well, but uh, uh, but sometimes it makes no sense. It's a terrible idea, right from the outside. It's but sometimes you you know, and and we make these big life decisions when something in us it just says this is right. This is what this is what you have to do. You you don't have a choice. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, Richard, jump in as, as you're seeing questions. Yeah, Katie has a question. So here's Katie. Hi. Um, I was wondering what advice you would have for musicians during um, just the times of COVID. It's easier for us to feel that burnout when we can't like connect with each other or make music the way that we want to. Is that, is that me? That's... Oh, no. Okay. I think it's got. Um, so, whew, advice for musicians. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, first, I actually think it's important to acknowledge the reality, which is this sucks. This this truly sucks, right? There's, I'm, I'm watching my son in there, you know, not only orchestra, but he's doing all the Zoom learning, which I'm assuming all of you are doing, right? This distance learning. I mean, distance learning. They, they got one out of two, right? You know, it's it, the distance part is right, it, it, but it's it's. I find it soul sucking. This this platform and and then further than that just COVID in general um i'm just not a fan you know <laughs> <laughs> and, and um and I, th I think it's just important to say that right because it's we're we're all really struggling and then specifically musicians i'm sure you all feel exactly how i do which is just that i ache to be back in in a room making music with people again i just every cell in my body aches for it. I, I didn't know how much I needed it. And I will never, ever take it for granted again. I never, I, I will cherish every moment I get to be in a room with, with musicians anywhere, anytime, just making music. The, the advice that I would say, if there is any advice, is that I, I have this image in my mind that, that, that what we're experiencing is um, in the best way, a calm before the storm. Because I actually think the moment we're able to go back and make music together, there's going to be a golden era of it. Because I, I think musicians like us all over the world are going to, they're going to eat at the buffet of music like they've never eaten before. I, there will be such a lust for making music together. And so I've, the image I've got in my mind is the slingshot that's just being pulled back further and further and further and building all this kinetic energy. And then when we can finally come back, just And so, as a musician, you can be, of course, practicing, but but more than that, just filling yourself with music. You can be taking these days as an opportunity to listen to music that you've never listened to before. 
you know, go on your Spotify binge and really go down the rabbit hole or your YouTube rabbit hole. Just go way deep into things you never imagined. Just consume, consume, consume and grow yourself as a musician. Do you know what I mean? So that when you come back, you've, you've got completely new eyes and you're really ready to pounce. It, it will come back. It's just a little more patience, I think. I hope that helps, Katie. So uh, I want to ask you about a, another quote that um, I heard you say because, well, I was going to generalize about your music, but you've written in so many different styles, which I really appreciate. There's not just, there is a kind of a sound that we associate with your, you know, the big dominant ninth chord thing but there's so there's so many different things you know renaissance style and baroque style and and all the, it it's a it's a tribute to your creativity so but very feelings driven uh i think for me i feel uh when i look at music there's music that moves me and music that doesn't and i only i'm lucky that you know, I get to choose what I do and I choose the stuff that moves me. So here's what I'd like you to, to speak about. When you write music, you say structure is everything. And that before, though the caveat to that, I guess, was when, before you write the music, you write a picture or a graph of the emotional, an emotional graph of the music. And I just thought that was fascinating. Can you? Tell us how you do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a big question. I'll, I'll try not to go wandering into the weeds. If, if I really go off the track, will you just throw a shoe or something, Paul? Get me back. I, I think we'd, we'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so starting with, first, thank you for saying that about all the different styles. Um, yeah, because I, I heard this other interview where he, tr he basically said, you had the British choral music sound. And I saw you kind of bristle and say, well, I mean, Thank you, I, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I always laugh because I think there's a certain style that I somehow got known for. And it's, you know, like a piece called Luxa Rumque or right. Sleep or When David Heard or all of these pieces kind of became my signature style, I guess. But but I'm always it always makes me smile because all of those pieces got written in the span of about two and a half years. Yeah. So, so I always think how funny it is that just, yeah, that little moment where I was playing with a kind of style became my style. Um, you mentioned emotion and I, I don't know how to write any other way. Hmm. I remember I was, I was studying with a man named David Diamond at Juilliard. He was really rough on me and he would tease me um, more than tease. He would mock me for being, for having to write from a place of emotion. And he used to always say to me, what are you going to do one day when you've got a deadline and you aren't inspired, aren't feeling it? And now after 30 years, I have the answer, which is, well, I'm screwed. <laughs> so, there, there's really, deadline doesn't help, just makes more anxiety, but it doesn't make the magic happen. That I, I have to feel it, it from my core. And then I try to infuse every single musical gesture I, I, I try to illuminate the, the emotional journey, the, every, every chord, every cluster, every single line, every silence is all in service to the emotional journey. And years ago, I stumbled on this, a way of writing music, which I still do now, which is what you were talking about, Paul, where I, I, I call it now emotional architecture. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is before I write a note of music, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll draw on a big piece of paper the, the emotional journey that I want not only the audience to take, but the performers to take. And it's, uh, it's abstract at first. So I'll, I'll use crayons or pens or pencils, anything just to get my hand moving and keep out of my, the judging part of my mind. And uh, maybe I'll start at the beginning and write um, you know, some, something dark and I'll say mysterious and muddy. And I might say something like, uh, like the beginning of Debussy's La Mer. Not that I want it to sound like La Mer, but I want it to feel the way the beginning of La Mer makes me feel. And then as it builds and builds, then I might say, okay, like that moment in Shawshank Redemption, Thomas Newman's score. Again, not the sound, but the feeling of it. And then, then I build this whole picture 
And then what I often do is I'll, I'll do five or six more pictures trying to refine the ideas so that I'll see that, oh, I keep drawing this squiggly thing over here towards the beginning. Well, that's obviously a building block. So let's, that needs to be repeated here and developed here. And at the micro level, we'll have little squigglies. Actually, this entire thing is a big squiggly just to kind of get the sense of what the thing will be. Um, this is something that I learned, th this kind of deep structure that I learned from a man named John Corleano at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. And until then, all the pieces that I'd written, I think either had very simple structures or were really kind of through composed. And it, he was the one who started showing me not only in his music, but in music of the great, great composers, Stravinsky, Bach, um, that, that the structure was so deep, right? That you'd have like, like great architecture where a musical motive, the perfect example is Beethoven five, right? Ba, 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 bum. So not only did he build the, the entire first movement off just those four notes, he built four movements off those four notes and there's four movements. I'm certain that is not a coincidence. There's four notes, there's four movements. It's almost fractal that at the micro level, it's being echoed at the macro level and, and it's endlessly self-referential. And I believe the reason they did that knowingly or not, I think Bach did this knowingly, is because it reflects the, the, perf the perfect beauty of the natural world. Mm -hmm. That that's the, the governing laws of the universe actually reflect that kind of fractal uh, structure. Anyway, this is what I mean about going off into the weeds. So, um, so, so what I do then is- it, it sounds more like flowers than weeds actually, but- Thank you for saying that. Actually, those are the perfect example for me, the perfect example. And then my artistic aesthetic, boy, we're getting abstract, but is that like a flower, that its first blush, the first blush of a piece should be simply beautiful. But it's just what it is, right? If you look at a flower, just there's just that moment. That, but if you take a flower and you, you can go to the cellular level and it's beauty upon beauty upon beauty, but different kinds of beauty, right? beauty that's about the function and the way the machinery of the of the flower works that's and that's how i try to construct these pieces so um and i i can again go into the weeds with that if you want me to show an example like of of how that manifests itself or i think that'd be super cool okay i'm so sorry guys i really have no idea how if you don't stop me i will nerd so far out uh, <laughs> so, so um uh, if, if I play this, can you hear that? Or does it cut out when I'm speaking over the top of it? No, we hear it. And the piano's not cutting out? No, it's fine. It's all good? Okay. So th those are the first notes to a piece that I wrote called A Boy and a Girl. And and I see some of you nodding your head. So you've at we least- We just did it. You, you're kidding me. You sang no. this? Oh. Oh, no. Okay, that's- I, I've done, with these two groups, I've I've done a lot of your music. Thank because you. because I relate to it and and so does most of the world evidently. <laughs> Thank you. I'm humbled by that. So so perfect that you know a boy and a girl. All right. So that I, I chose it because it it's um it's a little snow globe of I think my entire aesthetic when building it, building a piece of music. So um, you remember that 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 first line is stretched out on the grass, a boy and a girl, right? Okay. So what's beautiful about the poem, if you recall, it's in three parts, right? Stretched out on the grass, stretched out on the beach, stretched out underground. And where sometimes you have to really go looking for a structure. In this case, Octavio Paz, the poet, did all of the heavy lifting. The structure is so clear. You can even just see it on the page. It's in three parts. And all you have to do is read the words and it, the development is so obvious, right? It, it can really only unfold one way, I find, emotionally. Um, but by the way, as a side note, I always feel really strange when, when I take the bow after a piece like A Boy and a Girl, because Octavio Paz did all the heavy lifting. I, I never know why I'm getting the credit for this. I really just did what he was telling me to do. Um, so at the beginning, what I'm looking for is what I call a golden brick. So after I've got that structure, then I'm looking for a chord or a couple of notes that contain within all the DNA for the entire piece to unfold. Um, and in my mind, it's a little more than, than it's not, not just a musical motive. Although I'll bet if, 
if I had the chance to talk to Beethoven, he would explain to me that that's also not just four notes. Those not just arbitrary four notes. They probably meant something incredibly profound to him. And that's, that's weaved through the entire piece. In this case, what I wanted to do is have this, a, a few notes that are functioning on multiple levels. So the first is you remember, So it took me a long time to kind of find that little gesture. And I, I love it simply on a musical level because it sounds wistful and nostalgic and mythical a little. It's, and, it's, it's, and, and also incredibly simple, right? So then you'll recall Sopranos, you've got the melody, right? And without the altos, it's just white rice, right? It's pretty, pretty boring. I always give my favorite lines to the altos. Um, I just have a whole love affair with altos. I just love the alto aesthetic. They're just so smart and funny and sassy. And so the altos you remember are, they're a whole step below the Sopranos, right? But together, and you remember through the piece, right? It's not so easy to sing. You're, mm. you're constantly like this. And even, uh, in the rest of that phrase, right? But my idea was that the altos would be the boy of this boy and this girl, and the sopranos would be the girl. And what they would do from the very first notes is they hold hands, and they're going to lead this entire life together, holding hands, so that then the, the piece can only unfold in a certain way, right? There's a kind of dance that they do always together. And sometimes they might break apart for just a moment, grab hands again. And then even in death, you remember the last notes. They're here, that last hum. They're still holding hands, even in death. So, so that's the, the second level. And then there's, uh, you remember the final stanza is, um, stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, saying nothing, never kissing, giving silence for silence. And I remember so clearly when I was trying to map out how I would set the piece and thinking and thinking about those final lines. And then it was just, oh, of course, that's the governing principle for the entire piece is silence. It's right there in the poem. So even in the first two measures, what we get is stretched. And by the way, you can't hear it on the piano, but remember stretched out is a little bit of a crescendo, decrescendo. So you paint the idea of stretching, right? So for the audience, the first thing they hear is stretched silence, silence, and then one, two, three, then so already built in are these, these big blocks of silence. And Paul, I'm not sure how, how you conducted it, although, although just even talking to you, I can imagine how you did it. Whenever I do it, I actually conduct the silence with rubato as mm -hmm. if, right, it's almost like there's the, the old cliche that there's more music in the silence than there is in the notes. Mm -hmm. that the silence has texture somehow and it's it's as important as the notes mm -hmm. and for me with every piece i write i try to give the, the primer the the guidebook right up front like that so that immediately the music is functioning on, on these multiple levels and at the same time this is the most important part teaching the audience kind of giving them okay here's a compass here's a pickaxe here's a flashlight everybody ready okay come on let's go on this journey together and that you slowly teach and unfold the, this little snow globe world. And then the piece just unfolds. It just does what it's supposed to do. Um, right after that, and then I, I promise I'll stop talking, um, <laughs> is when they sing a boy. Remember this little bit? And then the sopranos and a girl. Oops, uh, what is it? And, uh, Right, the savoring bit. So my idea was that once we've established this world, that really you everything just has a little smoky wisp and it's gone. Just a, a it's ephemeral, right? There's this idea gone, this idea gone. And so I remember around that time I had seen a Japanese calligrapher, and I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they'll sit in front of a a, a blank manuscript paper. And they've got their their quill and their their ink there, and sometimes they'll meditate for hours and hours and hours. And then they reach over. That's it. The entire artwork is done in 30 seconds. 
But the truth is it's a lifetime of preparation for that moment and just waiting for that moment. And so I thought to myself, can I do the same thing with this boy and this girl that I wanted, I wanted the audience to know them. And right around the time I wrote this, this movie came out called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's such a beautiful movie. And in it, Jim Carrey plays way against type, this sweet, incredibly introverted, shy young man. And, and so he, that's how I saw this boy, just, just delicate and, and distant like this. And then the girl in the, in the movie is Kate Winslet. And she's got like orange, crazy dyed orange hair. And she's just fireworks. She's one of those personalities. And so even her, that even when every time we say and a girl, and then this, this holds true for all the peace. So that every time you get a boy, even in death, you still hear that personality. You hear the echo of his personality, just soft, tender, a heart that's too big. And then this girl just every time she explodes. And so the idea was by the end of that first page of A Boy and a Girl, the whole piece is there. And then all you've got to do is just let it unfold, just illuminate what the poet had tried to say. Sorry, I really went, went into the flowers, as you say there, Paul. <laughs> well, uh, that was just amazing. I, I wish we had talked before we did it. <laughs> we'll, have to do it again. we'll have to do it again, my wife is saying. Uh, I, 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 we've got some questions we need to go to, but I, I, that piece got so many comments. I have a, a good friend of mine who I sing uh, Celtic music with. I love Scottish and Irish folk music. And we have these Kayleys at his house where we drink and sing to the wee hours. And uh, he's, he's not a musician, but he, he gets it. And, and he just looked at me and he said, oh my God, that piece a oh boy and, and he it just he to his very core eric i mean absolutely at his core he loves that piece uh 